What's up, world? It's Ryan Banta again. Uh, had a lot of conversation recently on what we call the critical mass system, and I'm hoping that uh, Coach Burris will will join us via comment here um, on the uh, on the Facebook Live that we're doing today. Uh, first thing, if you are watching this from Facebook Live, great, welcome. If you're catching up with us a little bit later on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button and the like button. That would help us a lot and feel free to share this video. The more that you guys can share of this, the better. Um, the more questions you can ask, the better. Um, if you are watching this video a little bit later, um, that's okay too. Um, please, please, please make sure you fill out those questions because I can always cycle back and comment as we're moving forward, which would be really helpful. So a lot of people have asked about this system and what it entails because they're really impressed, obviously, with uh, Justin's prowess. Now, just so you guys know, I put the video of Justin's race that's on mile split um, that they covered for the uh, Great Southwest track and field meet, which is basically multiple state all-star teams against each other. Um, and Justin obviously was representing Team Missouri. And uh, the race was run at altitude. Albuquerque is basically like a mile up into the sky. Um, so the air is much thinner there. If you ever notice the indoor uh, United States championships are run there quite frequently. And uh, the sprinters run really, really fast in, and jump very far in thin air conditions um, because there's less wind resistance and there's less to run against. And so when you're talking about these minuscule amount of times or differences in distances and jumps, um, running at altitude is, is very, very helpful. Now, I think it's important to know uh, first and foremost is that I don't coach Justin, okay? I've been around Justin. He was a part of our summer track club that I was affiliated with last summer. And um, he is a great kid, a super hard worker, big positive personality, an amazing kid that you can root for. He's coached by my friend, Sean Burris, who is <laughs> um, in this book, The Sprinter's Compendium. And uh, basically, Sean is, I've mentioned many a times in many of my videos, and if you've read the book, you know that he's probably the biggest mentor in my career for the X's and O's of training and competition and how to get re people ready to run really, really, really fast for uh, basically any of the sprint races all the way up to the 800. Now, it's been in vogue recently that sprinters are doing less and less and less training, and we have this thing called feed the cats philosophy. Just straight up in front as we're talking about this today you guys need to know this is very different than feed the cats and um is much different looking than that particular system um in fact in many ways some of the people who really like that system might hesitate to implement this particular system based on their preconceived notions about volume and intensity and how much you need to be doing so the other thing you need to know as well is that Coach Burris has not just done this one time. He's not a one-trick pony. Um, Coach Burris has trained a number of great athletes at Ladue High School um, and then in his summer track club that has had many various names from the Ladue Lightning to the St. Louis Lightning to the Gateway Athletic Club to Gateway City. Doesn't matter. He is also heavily influential with his coaching tree of coaches who coach Bur uh, Buckvar, Coach Wilbrink, uh, myself, um, basically Coach Tripp, um, a number of different coaches around the area have been influenced by uh, Coach Burris's work. And what's interesting and, and, and important to understand is as we've moved away from this system of high intensity, high volume training, and we've moved more towards this more very impactful minimal amount of dosage as possible of training and feeds the cat system where you've got, you know, sprint runs, uh, flying sprints of 10 to 20 to 30s. We're taking entire days off of practice and things like that. That These are two very different systems. Um, I'm going to talk about it from the respect of what I do and how I use the system. Um, so full disclosure, my team, every year we've got in the state with a four by four, we've been all state except for this year. Uh, and the reason why uh, this year we were unable to be all state is that we had actually an athlete get injured 
in the state championship who is our second fastest 400 meter runner and so we had to make a substitution and even in that situation we almost finished in the top eight if it wasn't for the fastest young lady in the country uh to run her one 400 of the year <laughs> where her relay was in dead last and uh, she was able to run a 55 second split and move them all the way up uh into first so pretty incredible on their part, but also bounced us out of the all-state finishes. But other than that, every year we've qualified a state championship, uh, four by four, we've been all-state. And um, I take a lot of pride in that. But more importantly, as we talk about that, people would say, well, in this critical mass system that we're talking about, obviously if it benefits 400 meter runners, you would be really good at the four by four. What about the 100? What about the 200? What about the long jump? What about the four by one and the four by two? Well, this year we, you know, had two athletes qualify to state in the 100. We had two athletes qualify to state in the 400. We had one athlete qualify in the open two. We had an athlete qualify in the long and the triple jump. Uh, we were all state in the one and the two, the four by one, the four by two, uh, long jump and triple. And in the 100 and 200 in four by one and four by two, we were second in the state of Missouri. And if it wasn't for uh, a few particular athletes um, that are very, very, very gifted genetically, we would have probably brought home some individual state titles and things like that in this particular event. Now, what's the point of me telling you that? The point is not to brag. The point is, is that the system works for all events. So what is this system? It was like, come on, man, to get to the point. So here's what it is. Simple put. Whatever events and whatever races you do, you need to reach a critical mass of intensity and volume. And what I mean by that is, is that we're not going to go out and run 10 times uh, repeat 400 meter dash. Okay. The Clyde Hart system and Clyde just retired um, as of about last weekend um, with, from Baylor. And he is the godfather of the 400 meter dash. Um, he would have a training system where they would start out with the largest volumes of the season at the very beginning. And they would work their way down the volume as they move through. And then at the same time, the intensity would wrap up. That's not the critical mass system. The critical mass system is where you take your athletes and you get them to a particular intensity and a particular distance, and then you play with that just above and below, and you break those runs up to mimic what the athlete would be doing in the, the race itself. And so that every day you'd have a different theme that would maybe work on a different part or aspect of that race, but your most critical, critical mass workouts would be just above just above and just below those particular distances which means if you're going to be very very good at the 200 meter dash you're going to have to run a 200 in practice you're going to have to run 450s in practice you're going to have to run 350s in practice you're going to have to run um 250s in practice these are things you're going to have to do now, when people hear that, they're like, oh, kids don't want to run the 400. It's terrible. They hate practice. They don't want to go there. Well, okay. But then you're never going to be truly as good as you could be in the 4x4 four four or the Open 4. And that's okay. Um, in the state where, you know, Tony Holler, who is the godfather of the Feed the Cat system, their state series has the 200 right in front of the 4x4. Four four. Well, if you're a coach in that state, you've got to make a choice. Do I want to run the 4x4 four four really fast, or do I want my fastest kids to run the 200? And most of your fastest kids are going to want to run the 200. So it makes it easier to adhere to that system, and at the same time, you're not going to lose out as bad because you have the 4x4 four four right after, which means a sprint coach is going to be not having their best sprinter on the 4x4 four four because they're likely, in most meets until the state championship, going to be in the 200. So then you can go with this system that's much shorter because the sacrifice that you're making isn't going to be as big and you can still be competitive. The other thing in Illinois is that there's there's winter track and some states don't have win, winter or indoor track, which means you have a month or a month and a half of additional indoor track meets, which then allows you to use the track meets as your lactic workouts or your special endurance workouts or your speed endurance workouts because those are workouts, whether you think of them that way or not. Now, that doesn't mean, what I mean by that is I don't want you to necessarily feel like, well, I've got to load my kid up into five or six races to count it as a workout. No, 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 no. Just anytime we compete, the body is going through some level of intensity that it does not see very often in practice. Okay, 
So the other thing about the critical mass system is that what it takes is it has an understanding of we've got to run these distances if we're going to be good at these things. So if you've got a kid that you think is only going to be a 100 meter dash athlete, then the critical mass system might not necessarily be where you start. You know, you might be better fitted to use the feed the cat system. But if they're going to run anything else above that, or if they're going to be expected to run multiple races in a competition, you're probably going to need to reach a critical mass of an intensity and of volume or distance in the, the actual training sessions to get to things where you can create adaptation. For example, if you're ever going to compete to bench press and you're maxing out, eventually you're going to have to get to where you can move a one rep max pretty heavy, which means you're probably going to have to train there. But what you guys have to understand is in the 100 meter dash, the fastest sprinters in the world, they don't contract one time. They contract up, upwards to 46 to 47 to 48 to 50 times, depending how tall they are, in the 100 meter dash. Which means that if we're only training them over 10, that does improve their absolute speed. And yes, you should probably have some workouts every 10 days that targets that. Or you should have a portion of your workout that targets that every day. So when you hear like, oh, I'm going to run a 350 or, oh, I'm going to run a 450. Well, that's going to slow my kid down or that's going to wear him out. Well, we don't start there necessarily. You're going to start again with the critical amount of dosage that a kid can do. So maybe the farthest you can go in a practice with a kid is 250 meters. And then when you hear that, you're like, oh, that's really long. Yeah, it is. But in order to maximize the, the intensity in which you need to hit that particular distance at as, as close as you can to race-like conditions from a 200 or a 250 or a 150, then you have to provide them the amount of space in order to then replicate it with another rep. So there are many times where I've been in a practice with Coach Burris that our athletes, when we're training them in summer track or in off-season winter conditioning, they would run and then they would sit for 15 to 20 minutes before they would do another interval. And then they would do another interval and then they would rest for another 15 to 20 minutes, you know? And so when you see the work, I like, Oh man, the kids can never do that. Well, that's not our starting point. But the problem is if you start with such a minimal dose and that's the only things that you do, and if you don't have an indoor season to bolster the amount of what I would call special endurance or speed endurance workouts that are called track meets, but in reality, they're workouts, you're going to have to do something to fill in the gaps so that the athlete can handle that. Now, you also have to have this massive recovery in between because the intensity is going to be so fast because you're talking about not absolute speed, but absolute intensities. So when you hear, well, speed only is acquired when the athlete is at 92, 93, 95%. You're not wrong. That's absolute speed. But very few of us run an entire 100 or 200 and especially the 400 at absolute speed. So instead, instead of thinking of a percentage of absolute speed, you have to think of percentage of effort. And so if I'm going to run two 450s in a practice, the traditional Baylor workout, right? The two 450s and the four 200s. I expect that my athletes are going to be wheels up and bust and butt over the entire 450 meters. And yes, as we talked about what we race model, we race model that 450 as if it was a 400 and we put cones up around the track so the athletes know what they're supposed to do in the different parts of the 450, okay? But more importantly, they also know that if I'm only doing two reps of these 450s and I've got 20 minutes recovery in between, the intensity is super, super, super high for that distance. It reaches the critical intensity of that distance where you're still quite close to an absolute total time of that race. So, for example, if I have young ladies who can run in the you know mid 50s on a 350 in the first week of the season i know that at the end of the year they're going to run somewhere around two seconds slower than that at the end of the year for a 400 which means now they're able to cover 50 more meters of distance but yet only be two to three seconds off of where they were so i know early on where these kids are going to be able to go 
I also time trial them over that distance so that I know. So when I have an athlete in my system, I can start to have workouts that I can gauge what they're going to do. Now, in order to achieve those things, if you're going to go out and you're going to bench press, for example, 350 pounds, well, you're going to have to get close to the 350 pound bench press to know that you can do it. The body's used to doing it. The body's able to contract and explode. Well, if you're going to run a, four, a 400 meter dash super fast, you're going to have to run a 350 and a 450 at very, very fast intensities. So if an athlete in my program, you know, busts out a 62 second 400 meter for their time trial, which is three weeks into the season, I know by the end of the season, if they're a returner, that they're going to be able to run four seconds faster than that on a split or an open. If they're a rookie, they're going to be able to run seven seconds faster than that. So now I have the marker, the water marker to know what they're going to be able to do at the end of the year. So when Coach Burris was coaching Justin, he knew that towards the end of the season, the goal was we're going to run under 45 seconds. He knew that in March. Okay. And he prepared for it through training by playing just above and below the distance in which he was running. That was his signature event. The other thing that he did is he would race above and below his signature event, and he wouldn't run the key race all that often. So what happens in the beginning of the season is you're going to build all the biomotor abilities that you need, and we're gonna build that as we push through, okay? And that happens all the way until we get to the competitive cycle. Then when we get to the competitive cycle, and that's with a rookie athlete that's never been in this program before. So at the beginning, it's going to look a lot like a long to short or a Matt Viev type system or something like that. But then when you get into the competitive cycle, then what ends up happening is you load and unload and load and unload and load and unload. And it looks more like what they call a Cheney periodization system. And so in that program, once you get to that competitive cycle, then there becomes a week that's a speed based week, a power based week a endurance or fitness-based week, and then a recovery week. So then every four weeks, you're, you're going boom, 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 in terms of volume. But that intensity, you're kind of going boom, 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 in different ways. And so all of the workouts, once you get to the critical point of your season, your competitive cycle, then rotate through on a three to a four-week cycle because now you're at the critical mass, which is the distances that you need to be running in practice, the amount of meters that you need to cover that are specific to the event that you're trying to run, and you're running the critical intensities that you need to run. But because the distances that are often attributed to this critical mass system are pretty intense, you also need to allow your athletes to recover so that they can get their legs underneath them and then you can hit them again. And so what ends up happening is once you get to that critical mass of intensity, the volumes don't need to change that much. You know, you may add 50 meters here on an individual run or undercut 50 meters on an individual run, or you might add in one more additional interval, okay? But they don't change entirely because you're loading, unloading, loading, unloading certain principles in the competition cycle, okay? And so then what happens is your athlete's always ready, but also once they've gotten there, and then all you're doing is you're just dialing up that intensity. So one of the things that we do in my program is we try to train at a 5% better than their current best, um, uh, whatever they might be in their event. So like, let's say in the 400, they've ran 60.1, I might train them at a 58.6 or something like that. Because then we're always training towards the goal. You know, you can't get better if you can't get there. Now, what are some of the values of this system. Number one, your athletes are able to run more events in a meet. And I don't mean run more events as in the number of events. They're capable, their range is better. They also can replicate more performances in a meet, which means yes, they can run more races. They can handle running six races at the state championship. This year at the state championship, um, because we lost a, a day, which usually split over two days, but it was one day. We lost a day, so they squished, they squished everything down into one day and made the sprinters run six races. If you're in the 100 to 200 in the 4 by one and 4 by 2 you had to run six races. So that's tough. 
And so you have to run the prelims of the 100, the prelims of the 200, the finals of the of the uh, 100, and then immediately run the 4x2, and then just after the mile, go run the 4x1, and then you get a couple of races, and then you get to run the 200. Because we've been through that in practice, it simulates that, right? Because you're giving them 20 minutes to 15 to 20 minutes in between. Well, that's about the minimal, the critical amount of time that you could get the most minimal amount of time that you're going to get in between races. And so guess what? My kids were prepared at the district meet. My kids were prepared. Okay. We got all of our kids through to the sectional meet that we planned on them getting through. And we had an almost every, had a, in all of the sprint prelims, we had seven of the eight sprint events so you had the 200 meter hurdlers, the two 100, the two 200, and the 400 girls. They all made the finals, okay? Because they're able to handle that amount of volume, even though it was 49 degrees out at sectionals, or at districts, excuse me, and it was raining on us the entire day and we had to run prelims. All of my kids made the finals and we won the district championship by only seven points. If my kids weren't prepared for that, they wouldn't be able to do that. If we're talking about just doing a Diamond League event where you're not having to run the finals in anything but maybe a 100-meter dash, you can train quite differently. But most of us that are high school coaches don't train in that situation. Instead, they have to be able to run multiple races over multiple weeks. They have to run multiple rounds and maybe have to run back-to-back -back days. So another thing that we find in Coach Burris's system in the critical mass system is that typically you have a very high intensity day followed by more of a moderate tempo based day followed by a complete active recovery day, which does that active recovery day looks a lot in the vein of the Tony Holler feed the cat system where literally the kids go home. They go home. All right. But instead of doing like partner shoulder hops or crisscross hops, that's great to do in the off season, and my program does that by by the by the way in the off season. But when you're in the regular track season, you've got to build things in that are more specific in that competition phase to what you're trying to do. So that tempo day becomes more of a lactic tolerance day, um, becomes more of a of a compass body composition day. Very very short recoveries, but high intensity. Why? Because we're now trying to build on. We've already taken care of the very big, large recoveries, huge intensity runs on Monday. But then on Tuesday, we're building more of what it is to prepare an athlete to handle tougher practices moving forward by building the buffering capacity of buffering waste and hydrogen ions and building up those enzymes to do, enzymes to do so. But also, there's a sneaky way that you're building up the cardio system of a sprinter as well so that what ends up happening is that they can run those reps over and over and over again like clockwork. Now you may say, well, I didn't only need my kid to sprint hard once, which is not true. It's not true. But even if you said that, okay, what do you run those 200s on on Tuesday with the short recovery? Well, Coach Buckvar, who also is a disciple of Coach Burris and in his coaching tree, he devised a system where the percentages of effort time up with basically the back end 200 pace of a 400. And so what you're able to do on those tempo 200 days is you're replicating that pace that an athlete is going to be able to run once they've already come through the first 200 through the second 200. So it becomes clockwork. So when you get to the first 200, you know how that second 200 feels because you've done it a bunch and you know you can hit those times because you've run it in practice over and over and over again. Then we have our active recovery day. Active recovery day can be, you know, standing handoffs. For the four by you know four by two doing standing handoffs real slow, they can you can do your um, you know hurdle mobility stuff. You can do Pilates. You can do visualization training. We're gonna warm up. We're gonna still have practice, but our practice is much lighter. Okay. Now the value of that though is if you have a kid that's doing the hurdles or the jumps or something like that, and they didn't run on Monday or Tuesday, well now you can get that workout in on Wednesday with that group because they didn't do the other workout, whatever it may be, the Monday or Tuesday workout, then they filter it in on Wednesday. So then every athlete, even though they might not be getting a lot of uh, energy system development work in those first two days because they're a jumper or a hurdler, now get it on Wednesday. So you slide that in. We've done that, which allowed our hurdlers 
um, when Coach Burnett was coaching them to still be able to have some of that work because when they're over with her at hurdles, they weren't doing a lot of running. They were just doing mostly technical work over one or two hurdles. So to fit the energy component into that, we use Wednesday as that day. Then what ends up happening on Thursday, this is an interesting day because depending on your week and your theme of the week will dictate what you do on Thursday. So if it's a speed week, you're probably going to be doing max and velocity work on Thursday, probably going to accelerate on Thursday as a, as a unit. Now, by the way, one of the things that you guys are going to have to stand is we, we do maximum velocity work and acceleration work throughout. When we're doing our warm-up drills, we're doing our biomechanics drills, and we're doing our acceleration runs, we're getting them in a three-point stance, we're having them accelerate, we're having them warm up. You know, those things are happening in the practice at some point, Okay. And we expect that if we're running a 450, through the first 60 meters, we tell the kids, you're going all out. Well, guess what? That's acceleration, and that's maximum velocity. Now, is that going to get down to the neural nitty-gritty that we want to get for a 100-meter sprinter? No, but we're not talking about a 100-meter specialist. And by the way, most of our sprinters are not 100-meter specialists. They're not, okay? So this system allows for your athlete to flow down and to flow up. And um, again, I've had in my time as a coach, I've had three different girls finish runner up in the state of Missouri in the 100 meter dash. All three of them are going to, well, one of them will run under 12 uh, this summer for sure. And the other two have run under 12 multiple times. But the one that I have right now is a freshman. So, you know, she's going to get only better, which is really exciting. You know, and she was able to do a multitude of things and be able to run six races. Okay, anyway, going back to Thursday. So Thursday, you might use it as a speed power day, acceleration day, and that's the theme. Now, you can do that because you had the active recovery day on Wednesday where the athletes are really doing no running at all. It's mostly mobility stuff, mental training, and probably just, again, targeting for the baton with the hand and working on stuff like that, which we spent a lot of time this year working on targets because I knew – that we were going to have some really good relays. So we wanted to make sure we spent a lot of time with that. Now, if it's a power week, you might be doing hill runs. You might be doing plyometrics. You might be doing medicine ball tosses uh, circuits on that Thursday if it's a power week. If it's a, uh endurance week, that may be a multitude of 150 sprints, you know, where you can do them flying. Um, you can do them from a three-point stance. You can do them in spikes. Or you could do another special endurance session. But like on Monday where you might have ran two 450s and four 200s, the very old-school traditional Baylor workout, on Thursday you might just run two 350s and that's it. And that's all you do. And you give them 20 minutes in between the 350s and it is freaking pedal to the metal and they're spiked up and they're all out. But whatever you do on Thursday – then you follow up with, if you're not competing on Saturday, a tempo type of day on, on Friday with a shorter runs of 120s, 150s, repeat ones, or whatever. Um, you could also follow up with uh, extended endurance bounding if you wanted to, again, depending on the theme of your week. Again, reaching the critical things in the competition cycle that looks a lot different than um, your build up to it. But once you get to these critical amounts of distances, and that's the thing that's very different. It's very different than the long to short. In the long to short, you know, you're running the Clyde Haddam running 24 200s. We never do that, by the way. Okay. We never do that. But that's where he starts. And then he'd work his way down as the season goes along. Buckvar, myself, and Burris, we work with a small number and we open it up until we get to those critical distances and intensities. And then once the athlete can handle those critical distances and intensities, then we stay there, and then we load, unload, load, unload, load, unload, load, unload with the different themes throughout the week. And then your training in those different weeks mimics that. And then Saturday, if you're racing, great, you're racing. And then what's really cool is line up your competitions with what you're trying to do. So if it's a speed week, then you probably should run the 100-meter dash and do the four-by-one. If it's a power week, you might go, you know, long jump if the kid's a really good long jumper and run maybe the four by one, four by two or something like that or run another sprint. And if it's a uh, endurance week, then they run the 400 if the 400 is their best event. Or maybe they jump on if they're really like more of a really long sprinter, somebody who's not a cat, then you would throw them maybe on a four by eight, you know, and move them all the way up to that. And then on the recovery week, you just run one race on that Saturday or Friday. And that should probably be their specialty event as well. 
And that's how you manage that in competition. Now, if you don't have a competition on Saturday, then what ends up happening is then that Saturday becomes a special endurance or a speed endurance workout, depending on what you've done in all those other days. You do not want to have three special endurance workouts in a week. That's crazy. You do not want to have three lactate workouts in a, in a week. That's crazy. So whatever you do on Saturday should be speed endurance, um, should be uh, maybe acceleration work, block work, very powerful, quick stuff, but we're going to stretch it out just slightly, again, with big recoveries. So even if you're running just a one, like four 150s and we race model a 200 using the 150, and we do that on Saturdays when we practice on Saturdays occasionally, uh, I like that a lot, and that's in the book as well, um, we're still going to have huge recoveries. Those kids are not running for 15 minutes. 15 or 20 minutes between a 150 because again we want to simulate the intensity and the effort that we want out of them to create the change that we need so that they're competitive so again on monday tuesday we have the two workouts that are kind of tough back to back to simulate a state meet situation then just like feed the cats we have an active recovery i don't send my kids home because culturally i can't do that um, that would not play very well amongst um, the other athletes on the team. And more importantly, I can't send them home because they may have other stuff I want to get done that I think actually has value, which is watching film, visualization, targeting handoffs, things like that. Then Thursday, depending on the theme of your week, could be anywhere from accelerations, max velocity work, to speed endurance, to special endurance. Again, it depends on your theme, to extended bounding, medicine balls, whatever it may be. Friday tends to be more of a tempo day if you don't have a meet on a Saturday, but it could be a tempo variety of different things. You don't have to do the same thing you did on Tuesday. You shouldn't. It always should be shorter. It should always be more explosive and more powerful if you're not competing on Saturday. If you are competing on Saturday, then Friday is obviously pre-meet. You're only going to do a couple short runs, a couple short handoffs, block starts, technical stuff like that that's very short. And again, we do that just to stimulate the nervous system to get it ready for Saturday's competition without exhausting it. And then Saturday, you come back with a special endurance or speed endurance workout, or they race, which again, if you have a extended track and field season, if you have indoor track, the critical mass system might not be something you have to do. And then you can have joyful athletes all the time because their tough uh, special endurance and speed endurance workout doesn't need to be on Monday because it's happening every Saturday. And then you can spend Monday doing other things. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about a very different system. Okay. And once you get your kids to that, they're used to doing that. And I always say, like, look, if we start with these really, really tiny intervals in, in training runs, that's great for absolute speed. It's great if you have an indoor facility and you can do those things where you don't have to worry about pulling hamstrings. But for us, we can't do that. And so what I always like to say is I want to rip off that Band-Aid. I want to get to those intervals as soon as we can without rushing it, which means I'm not going to artificially hold the kids back if they're making progress. We're going to move to the longer runs so that eventually even my rookie kids, which we haven't talked about, but to answer one of these questions, my rookie kids always do less volume than any of the other kids in my program because we don't want to run them out and we don't want them to not enjoy it. And we don't want them to get blown up before they get to come to some of the fruition of all the things that they've been able to do earlier. So even though, you know, my studly kid this year was a freshman, you know, her volume in, was less and it was less the whole year, even if she could handle more, um, it was less. She'd always had one or two less intervals. And then next year, we have an opportunity for growth as she's more fit, more mature, understands the program, her training age is a little higher. She's going to get into the program where she's going to do a little bit more because then she's going to be able to handle it. And every kid that's ever been in my program that has not made bad choices in terms of drugs or alcohol or whatever have always come back the second season and run much, much faster. Two reasons. One, they understand the program. And two, I, under, I understand them and I can be a better coach to them depending on what they need. Now, if I feel like I have a pure 100 meter dash and four by one and maybe 200 ish type of kid, then I would do the feed the cat system. But most of the kids that I have, I've discovered are, are a mixture of, you know, slow twitch and fast twitch fibers and tend to be more in the middle in terms of their action. Now, the big stud that I had this year, um, who was really good as a freshman, this coming winter, because she's one of the fastest girls in the state in the 100-meter dash, 
we're going to train a little bit differently where we're going to put in a unit and a component which is going to emphasize reaction time and her first 30 meters of her race because that's what she needs to improve. She's plenty fit. So now we've got to work on that. A uh, different athlete that I had that was a freshman and ran 58.75, she's going to train every other day because her body cannot handle um, the training that's required of her to go back to back to back to back. So even though we have systems, feed the cats, critical mass system, each athlete presents a different puzzle for you to put together. So you can't just be wedded to one thing, but you have to realize why you're doing what you're doing and you need to explain that philosophy to your kids. So I tell all the kids in my program, we're going to be great at the 400 meter dash, period. We're going to be great at it. And you're all going to run it at some point in the year and you're all going to probably be on a four by four so that we never have kids that say, that's not an event I do. I don't do that. No, you're going to do it. It's not left up to the distance runners. It's not left up to the B-level sprinters. You're going to do it. And if it's our best event and our best chance to be all state in the state championship, I'm going to load that up. If not, then I won't. I'll put the kids in different events. It This year, we knew that we could run three different relay combinations. I had a different group of kids running the 4 by 2 than I had in the 4 by one or I had in the 4 by 4 and some of those kids crossed over. Like I had a kid who was on my four by one and my four by four. I had a kid that was in my four by two and my four by four, but not on my four by one. It's just the way it goes. And so we had all those kids. So we knew that we could get all those events to the state championship. And we were one leg away. It wasn't our leg. Our girls did their job. It was one leg away from being all state again this year with a totally different group in the four by four. And that's pretty cool. But the reason why we're able to do that is because the athletes have range. They can handle multitudes of events in a meet um, and yet not be overloaded. And also they have the training development to know what actually is their best event. They're not going to run a great 400 if all they're doing is running 20s and you don't have an indoor season where those meets become hard practices. They're not going to be able to run a really good 400, at least not as good as they could. They're not. It's just training has consequences. You want to be a good miler, you're going to have to run the mile, you know, period. You want to be good at the 400, you're going to have to run the 400. You want to be good at the bench press, you're going to have to move heavy weight. You can't get on the Nautilus machine and do the bull flex. That's not the way it's going to be. You want to be good at the 100-meter dash, you better have a neurological output, and you better be running some flying sprints. So the reality is, is that each of these systems have their strengths and their weaknesses. But you have to understand that kids and athletes in general – will be able to handle larger volumes than you probably expect, but they can't do it all at once. They have to slowly but surely be built up to that. Same thing with intensities. But then once they get to that critical volume, which is just below or just above their race specialty, okay, and once they're able to run it within up 95% of their effort of a maximal output of that particular race, now you can play in that area and you never have to go away from it too far. Because if you go away from it too far, so like if you're peaking and all of a sudden you're like, okay, we're not going to do 350s anymore. We're not going to do 450s anymore. We're just going to run some 120s. They're not going to be ready. They're not going to be ready. Just like if a girl's going to run the 100 meter dash and you're like, okay, now we're just going to go back to running 20s again and we're never going to run 120s or we're never going to run 80s or we're never going to do long extended acceleration runs to, you know, the, to build from the drive phase all the way up to upright running mechanics. If you don't do that stuff, they're not going to be ready. So peaking doesn't mean you completely exhaust everything. It just means, hey, maybe you take a rep away. So instead of the kids running a 450 and another 450 and four 200s, maybe they're running one 450 and then three 150s in the end of the practice. And that's what your peak cycle may end up looking like. And people are like, well, they don't need to do that much work on a Monday before that race. Um, maybe, maybe not, depending on what type of athlete they are and what type of racer they are. There's a lot of data that shows that peaking totally and completely unloading a kid and having them be super fresh isn't right. Now, again, that's very athlete dependent. So you need to know what your athletes are. Uh, Hank Kredgenoffer used to talk about that all the time. With uh, He had two sprinters that were very different. One sprinter needed two weeks off. The other sprinter couldn't handle having, you know, four or five days off before a run. You know, but you still need to be doing things as you peak that mimic the things that they're going to do. You just do less of it. So instead of running, you know, a 600 or something like that, you run a 350. Instead of running 200, you run a 150. Instead of running four of them, you run two or three of them. So you're still at that critical mass. You're still at that critical intensity, but the, but it changes. The workouts move and allow the athlete to rise to a peak. 
And so I was graced by, you know, having a really great kid who works really hard and she peaked uh, perfectly for the state championship and ran two PRs in the state championship into a headwind, into a headwind. And she was a hundred meter dash girl. And a lot of the stuff that she did was more critical mass than it was feed the cats, which gave her volume and range and the ability to replicate the speeds and all of that. And uh, still we were able to bring her to a peak and she's going to only get faster as we move forward. So that's kind of the critical mass system in a very general sense. Um, if you guys have more specific questions, because this is probably the longest Facebook Live I've done yet, um, please ask these questions and Coach Burris or myself can address them to you um, as we're moving forward to be able to um, get you guys down to the nitty gritty of these answers. Um, Coach Burris is on my Facebook. Um, he's also uh, on Twitter with Gateway Athletic. There's a whole bunch of things that you guys can do. Um in order to, in order to um, get to the, the results that you want. Um, and again, we're open to communicating with you guys. Coach Buckvar as well is open to communicating to you guys about this system and how it looks and the specifics, because I know I'm throwing a lot at you because we're kind of free talking here. Um, but uh, it works. It works specifically for the 200 and 400. It works well with high school kids um, and athletes continue to produce and get better. Uh, through all four years that they're in high school with me, even the female athletes who come in a little bit more varsity ready because they're more mature than boys are. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, please give it a like, give it a share, um, all that kind of wonderful stuff. And again, if you've got questions, ask them and then we can follow up because I know I talked about a lot of different stuff here and uh, it can get lost in the weeds as we've discussed it. All right, guys, I love you. Peace out. Talk to you soon.